Well, for those of you who don't love the Roman army, I'm afraid we're going to get more on the Roman army. Um, but this is a very important monument, which is necessary to know about, because uh, this is the monument that tells us that no matter how accurate Trajan Column might be in showing the Roman army at war, it's a very stylized uh, system of showing the Roman army. It shows the Roman army at its best. Now, what I mean by this is, of course, if you um, go around any military town and you look at soldiers off duty and on duty, they've got two different types of uniform. And what we learn from this particular monument is the Trajan Column shows us, in a sense, an imaginary Roman army, not the Roman army that fought in the Dacian Wars, a stylized Roman army, but not the actual army. This is the restored version of a very important monument in Romania at a place called Adam Clisi. Uh, it's missing an I in modern Romanian because the original name was Adam Kilisi, the Church of Adam. Uh, Adam Clisi, the restored Tropium Triani. Tropium is trophy, Trajan's trophy. A trophy, of course, built at the end of a battle. And as you can see on this restored version, you've got a representation of a trophy there. <laughs> this monument is in the shape of a circular mausoleum. It has a trophy carved in stone on the top, and the inscription on the trophy tells us that it was dedicated in the year 112, uh, to commemorate Trajan's Dacian War. So it's the same date, more or less, as Trajan's Column. Some people think it was built to commemorate an actual battle in Trajan's Dacian Wars, but it's south of the Danube. We do know that from excavations around here that there was a major defeat of a Roman army at this site under Domitian. There's the remains of an altar with a list of well over a thousand names on it, Roman soldiers who died in battle. So my idea about the monument is that it was, to Priam Triani, this particular monument, is it was built, yes, to commemorate Trajan's wars, but also, remember this concept of the Roman army, Mars altar, Trajan the Avenger, Augustus the Avenger, it makes this visible statement, the Roman army will always win in the end. Well, the monument itself fell down over the years, and um, it's got a rubble and concrete core with limestone slabs around the outside. Um, the monument is 35 metres in diameter, about 18 metres high originally. This is how it's been reconstructed. Uh, it's got the facing of limestone slabs. <coughs> We've got different frieze up here from there. This is what we're interested in, 54 metopes, carved relief slabs, uh, of which I think 52 have survived. Uh, one's certainly missing, one is pretty broken. One is in Istanbul Museum, because they were all collected and put together in the 1850s to be sent to Istanbul. Uh, only one ever made it. All the others are still actually at Adam Clisi in a very wonderful uh, museum there. The monument itself has these 54 or so, well, you can see there's at least two missing there, 54 uh, metopes that go round it. They're carved in a rather flat relief. Uh, they're using the local limestone, which is not a very good building stone, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, the metopes are 1.5 metres high, 1.2 metres wide. The quality of the work is nowhere near as good as what you would ex uh, see on Trajan's column. Uh, the quality of the work is such that it indicates it's done by local people. Now, there is a Roman town not far away, which is also called Tropium Triani. And that was the settlement of Roman soldiers who had taken part in trade and station wars. And the theory is that this monument was built by them, so it's made by them, it's carved by them. Now, as I said, my understanding of the monument is that it commemorates Trajan's Dacian Wars plus this earlier Roman defeat on this site. Uh, Romanian archaeologists um, believe it is the Romanian equivalent of Trajan's Column. <laughs> I'll come back to that in a moment. 
This aerial view incidentally um, shows you how the monument's been restored. Um, these are the original blocks that form the base of the monument, uh, put aside there with no sign to explain what they are, so you always wonder what it, whether it's just a children's playground or something. Uh, the original blocks being in the museum. Well, let's look at what these blocks show. The blocks are very provincial, second rate in quality. Now you can see the holes in the limestone. This is not a very good stone for working in. It doesn't take detail very well, and um, it doesn't weather very well. But the reliefs are really absolutely quite fascinating. One thing we notice immediately, Roman soldier, he's wearing his sword on the right hand side. The only Roman soldiers that wore their side on the, uh, sword on the right hand side were legionary soldiers. So this is a legionary soldier. But he's wearing a scale armour, overlapping metal scales. If you look at Trajan's column, and I'll show you a slide at the end of this particular sequence, all the soldiers on Trajan's column, legionary soldiers, are shown wearing the hoop armour, Lorica segmentata. He's wearing an arm guard. You can see the overlapping strips of metal. And he's wearing leg defences. This is because the traditional Dacian weapon was this. It's called a falx. And you use it to cut people's legs off, or cut their arms off. Ooh, nasty weapon. Look on top of the helmet. Can you just see that cross shape? That's to protect the helmet, the head, from the falcons going through the top of the helmet. A few of the soldiers on Trajan's column have got that cross shape on. None of them have got scale armour, not legionary soldiers. None of the legionary soldiers have the arm guard. None of the legionary soldiers have leg guards. So this is more realistic than Trajan's column. Another point about this particular thing is, well, that's a Dacian. He's got a typical Dacian hat, Dacian beard, Dacian baggy trousers. But this guy in the background, can you see how his hair is tied up on the side? This is tied up in a... a where hairstyle known as the Swabian knot. So called because it was worn by the people of Swabia, which is now modern Germany. So this is a German. This is not a Dacian. So this represents a dead German in the background here. Well, let's look at another metope. Again, what do we have? We've got a Roman legionary soldier. He has to be a legionary soldier because only legionary soldiers had their sword on the right side. Now, that might not seem to make sense to you. You know, you think, oh, we've got to draw your sword that way. Well, no, because if you draw your sword that way, you've got to hold your shield out to get the sword out of the way, and somebody else can go, eh, why are you doing that? So you keep your shield here, you draw your sword like that. That side's protected by the next man's shield. See? So it is sensible. He's wearing what we call ring mail armour. You can see he's got an arm protector, but no leg protector. Again, he's fighting, well, he's killing a Dacian in this particular case. Well, I'd like that sign um, seen in the, the film Toy. Woo, jump on top and stab him in the back. Definitely a Dacian with a falx. So, and in the background, of course, somebody dead. The other scenes on the column um, continue this thing. These are legionary soldiers. You can tell from the way they wear their sword. Wearing scale armour or ring mail armour, they are not wearing this. On Trajan's column, all the legionary soldiers show this type of armour, known as lorica segmentata. So Trajan's column is fantastic from one point of view. We can reconstruct Roman methods of warfare, their dress from it. But it doesn't actually tell us what happened in the Dacian War, what soldiers were wearing in the Dacian War. Uh, other scenes from the Tropaim Triani. Well, there's a great argument about how the scenes go together. Uh, as I said, the metopes were all collected together and put in a, a row to be taken to uh, Constantinople. Um, but the only one actually got to Constantinople, that's the one that's in the Istanbul Museum now, we don't actually know how the other release fit together. I should have brought along with me this enormous book, which is that thick, 
which is a Romanian archaeologist's mathematical analysis of the width and the height of each one of these to allow him to reconstruct the metopes around here as representing the two Dacian walls. So that this would be the local copy of Traden's column. Uh, the alternative is that it represents just a single processional uh, uh, freeze. And if I can find a mathematician who's willing to do the work for me, then I'm happy to let them have the data and they can do the hard work, the number crunching. But you can see it's part of it. Some of the scenes do show a triumphal procession. Uh, here the sort of Roman <laughs> soldier with a very nice um, Trajanic hairstyle on it. Incidentally, none of the soldiers on the Adam Cleese monument have beards. Some of the soldiers in the Trajan's column do. And you can see he's marching in chains, a Dacian prisoner in a, uh, a triumphal procession. And some of the scenes do show uh, a figure who has to be the Emperor Trajan, although nothing survives of his face. Uh, but he's wearing a general's type uh, costume there. He's, he's got his sword on the left hand side, which a general would have. I mean, generals don't use their swords, do they? You know, they don't get involved in battle scenes. So that has to be the Emperor Trajan. He's got palm leaves and he's got his personal bodyguard with him here wearing short trousers. So, um, Adam Cleesey, the monument to Adam Cleesey is very important from this point of view. Trajan's column ostensibly shows the scenes from Trajan two Dacian wars. Ostensibly in the sense that that's what it seems to show. Well yes the scenes probably are based on a real narrative. You've got the wounded soldiers in the field hospital and you've got that funny scene of the man falling off the mule or the horse which nobody can explain. Uh, it has to be based on a real event that people must have been familiar with but we don't know what it was. Trajan's, um, the, the Topayam Triani a monument built to commemorate the Dacian Wars, but not necessarily directly related to the Dacian Wars, uh, shows his Roman soldiers in completely different armour <coughs> from Trajan's column. So, you know, which one is the more accurate? One of the reasons the um, Romanian commentators believe it might, the freeze on this might have been in two sections, first and Dacian War, is basically because you've got this very strange metopay. It's the only one that doesn't show people. Well, there are two missing, we don't know what they showed. Uh, and it seems to sow sheep and goats. Um, the conventional explanation is this represents the uh, prosperity the wealth, the agricultural richness of uh, Dacia. Um, well, I leave that up to you to make your own decision on what that one is. So that's the Tropaeum Troiani. But there are, of course, other monuments. There's a one more relief frieze which is connected to the Dacian Wars, and that's the so-called Great Trajanic Frieze. The Great Trajanic Frieze um, is a series of panels uh, that clearly represent the Dacian Wars, uh, a series of panels that belong to a frieze that must have been 33 metres long and 3.3 metres high. This is the third longest piece of relief frieze in antiquity. The Parthenon is first, the Great Altar at Pergamon is second. We don't know where it comes from. Parts of it, as I'll show you in a moment, were rebuilt into the Arch of Constantine. Uh, in 312. Uh, it could have come from here if that was a continuous wall. Uh, there's no sign that they curve, so it's unlikely to come from the sides here, but we really don't know where the Great Trajanic Frieze comes from. Well, the Great Trajanic Frieze, along with lots of other works of art, would, um, parts of it were rebuilt into the arts of Constantine. This arch was built in the year 312 to commemorate uh, Constantine's victory at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. Um, the two parts of the relief, the Great Trajanic Frieze we're going to look at, are built here in the Infidos, same position as the ones on the Arch of Titus. Two of the parts are on the outer side of the arch there. And then there's various other bits and pieces which are known of um, throughout uh, Rome. Now, the Arch of Constantine, because parts of the Great Trajanic Frieze are included in this, Trajan's Forum must have been in a bit of a state of decay by 312. 
uh, this again creates a bit of a problem because we're told that Constantius II, his son, when he went to Rome, said Trajan's Forum is the most beautiful building I've ever seen. <laughs> but you see, the Arch of Constantine, this is Hadrianic, for example, these are from the time of Marcus Aurelius, but it also has eight statues, four on each side, and these statues are statues of Dacians that were taken from the colonnade in Trajan's Forum. So either they decided to rip off large chunks of Trajan's Forum for use in this arch, or it was in a state of decay. Uh, we just really don't know. Well, the two bits of battle frieze in the intrados and the two bits on the outer face were both recarved. The heads on the uh, emperors were recarved to make them look like Constantine. So they don't look like Trajan. But the, the two big panels that we have, or four panels altogether, uh, in the intrados, the inner part of the arch, uh, very beautifully carved. Uh, now, just look at the overall similarity between this and what we saw in the Arch of Titus. And then think Chancellaria reliefs. Can the Arch of Titus reliefs be Domitianic? Well, yes, they could. But that would then make the Chancellaria reliefs much earlier in Domitian's reign to commemorate the Chatham War, not the um, war against the Sarmatians. Uh, it's impossible to conceive of the Titus reliefs being the same date as the Chancellaria reliefs the Titus reliefs fit in with this much better. Very deep carving, showing um, a battle scene. Uh, you've got the emperor riding into action here. His cloak is blowing in the wind. He's got standard bearers behind him. Uh, a, a type of scene here in which you've got the, a general on, on horseback riding over a defeated barbarian is very common in first century Roman tombstones, but goes out of fashion a bit later. Now we know we're talking about Dacian because we've got Dacian clothing, typical Dacian trousers, typical Dacian hats, like that. Uh, that's not a Swabian knot, it's a top head knot, which is nowhere described in the classical literature, so we don't know whether it's a German or not. This guy wearing ring mail with um, his sword on the uh, right hand side is a legionary soldier or probably uh, one of the emperor's mounted bodyguard. Trajan had his own mounted bodyguard, uh, mainly Germans, so that's what we've got here with the horse in the background. And you can see more Romans back here, Dacians trying to escape over there, uh, getting knocked over in the process, <coughs> dropping their shields as well. It's full of movement, movement. it's really fantastic. Uh, another part of the Great Trajanic Frieze uh, shows the end of one more uh, battle scene. Again, this characteristic thing in first century funerary architect, um, architecture for Roman soldiers, the soldier on a horse galloping over a, a dead uh, Dacian there, uh, somebody trying to surrender, one being taken prisoner, uh, this man wearing scale armour here. But then you suddenly go over to this scene, and this is the Adventus. This is the arrival of Trajan back in Rome at the end of the First War or the Second War, or is it a synchronous frieze? In the sense that the frieze just gives you a general representation of the Dacian Wars, not divided into a series of specific battles. Well, that's what the bits of the frieze seem to imply. It's, just a, con it's a continuous frieze, but it's a, not a narrative frieze. It gives you bits of the cartoon. Well, here's Trajan. The lady floating in the air behind him is Victoria. Uh, Victory, she's holding the wreath above his head there. He's being welcomed um, back into Rome uh, by Roma, the, the spirit of Rome. You can recognize her by her helmet there. Uh, a completely different piece of work from um, what we see, of course, on Trajan's column, a very exciting piece of work. It's really full of movement. It fits in with the Arch of Titus uh, tradition. But it mixes events. We don't have this continuous um, narrative all the way through. It ignores realities in time of space, in a sense. You know, you've got all these different parts. It puts you in, da 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 at the end. Uh, it's, in effect, it's a synopsis. Of the, of the two Dacian Wars. It's not purely narrative, 
It summarises the wars, puts them all together in one thing. This Roman desire for narrative sculpture continues throughout, of course, the whole period. And we see it very clearly expressed in these two particular reliefs, which are now inside the Curia Julia and impossible to photograph. Uh, these are known, or they, for a long time, they were known as the Anaglyphia Tri Hadriani. They were thought to represent the Emperor Hadrian. Well, as you can see, the head is missing from the Emperor figure, uh, and it's very badly damaged there. Um, but current scholarship uh, relates it to the Emperor Trajan. We know that there were two episodes uh, in Roman history when an emperor burnt all the, the tax books, the debts owed by Roman people. This shows one was under Trajan and one was under Hadrian. And I'll explain how this one shows one of those episodes. Originally, these panels, which have got a carving of a Suva Taurelia on the back, a sacrifice scene, uh, formed a balustrade. They must have formed some kind of barrier uh, standing upright like this. It may have been on the rostrum, it may have been somewhere else, we don't know. Uh, we're missing, unfortunately, the last part of this particular one. But you can see how a continuous balustrade effect. Well, what do they show us? Well, the right panel on the, the left hand side, uh, and I'll explain how we know it's the right panel as we go along, shows what is clearly an imperial type figure. He's standing on a roster, a raised stage. Uh, behind him, there is an arch, and then you have a hexastyle temple, then you've got a gap, and then you've got a building with, with a series of arches along the front. The imperial figure is addressing a group of people. It includes uh, men and women, children holding purses and things like that, and they're all going, great emperor, we love you so much. Let's go on to the next bit. The building continues with the arches in the background, and then we get this tree standing next to a statue, and here we have the same imperial figure. He's talking to uh, a mother and a child. Uh, there his advisors are behind him. This is the key part in the whole relief. There is only one building we know of in Rome that served for public occasions, which has an arcade along the front of it, and that is the Basilica Julia. This allows us to reconstruct what's going on. If that's the Basilica Julia, this gap here is a street <coughs> called the Vicus Tuscanius, which ran between the Basilica Julia and the Temple of Castor and Pollux, rebuilt by Tiberius before he became emperor. The Temple of Castor and Pollux stands next to an arch of Augustus, and in front of the arch of Augustus, it's the Temple of the Divus Julius, which had side staircases going up to a rostra on the top. So we're looking at this. We're looking more or less in a, you know, as if we're in a, a camera crew along a set of rails, sort of going like that. You know, we're, we're filming the whole scene as we go along. We're looking at something with the emperor standing here on the rostra in front of that temple, so we can see the arch has been twisted out of perspective. Then we've got the Temple of Castor, then we've got the Vicus Tuscunianus, then the Basilica Julia. There was, in Roman time, but nobody knows exactly where, in the Forum, a tree next to a statue of Marius. Do you know, do you know the story of this guy? Oh, you should do. This took place not very far away from here. I'm surprised. I'm shocked. This is a local myth. Um, See, he's there, and he's there. He's the guy from Phrygian guy who was asked to judge a singing competition between Apollo and I can't remember who the other one was. Um, anyway, he didn't choose Apollo. So Apollo had him punished by having him hung upside down and his skin was taken off. Ah, that will teach you to make a mistake. <laughs> but is it a local story? Ta, 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 ta. What do you learn in your Iron Age and Bronze Age classes? Anyway. There's the tree and the statue, Basilica Julia, tree and the statue, this is the left-hand panel. In the left-hand panel, 
we have still the remnants of the arcade. So that's still the end of the Basilica Julia, and then we come over here. Now, in the foreground, what we've got here are a group of guys all carrying what we can recognise as wooden tablets. They are certainly soldiers because they've got this little belt thing on the front, which is um, not shown on that guy there, but you can see these little dangly things here. These are what soldiers wore. Soldiers were not supposed to wear a uniform or carry weapons in Rome, but obviously you could recognise a soldier by his boots and the dangly thing. They're bringing up a pile of clearly wax tablets, stacking them up in a pile there, in front of an imperial figure. As I said, there are two records of burning of the books, the tax books, one under Trajan, one under Hadrian. This is what this represents. Trajan saying, OK, I'm going to forgive you for not paying your taxes. Um, I'm going to burn all the records, and we, you can start off with a, a, a clean sheet all over again. So we've got a Basilica Julia. Here we've got the um, temple of... <coughs> do, 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 do. Vespasian and Titus, hexastyle temple there. We know that there was an arch of Tiberius somewhere in, in this area, but it's never survived, so that's probably what that is. And here we have the uh, temple of Concord, and the missing slab must have shown the Curia Julia. So for this second part, well, we can now actually place the statue of uh, Marius and, uh, and the trees somewhere in this area, the relief misses out this temple, the temple of uh, Saturn, but it's got the hexastyle, oh, sorry, oh, just, yes, it is hexastyle, temple of Vespasian and the temple of Concord. Unless that is, let's just go back for, um, one, unless that is Saturn, that's Vespasian and Titus, and Concord was there, which is always a possibility. So in this second one, we're looking at a... <laughs> A scene that goes around like that. Absolutely beautiful, full, and wonderful of movement. Uh, one last piece of Trajan architecture to look at, the Trajan Arch at Beneventum. The money from the Dacian Wars helped Trajan pay for a major road improvement uh, from Beneventum, uh, in central Italy, uh, to um, Brindisi, I think it was, or on the uh, east side of Italy. And it's a beautifully preserved arch. Um, the only bit that's missing is that bit there. Uh, a bomb went off near here in the Second World War and blew part of the arch off, so we don't have that uh, anymore, unfortunately. This arch uh, celebrates the building of, of this new road. And the, the overall form, where you recognise it's a triumphal arch, uh, the big differences, of course, between this and other arches, is it's absolutely covered with relief panels. There are 14 relief panels altogether. Uh, the dedication itself um, refers to Trajan indicating he was dead. So it's completed by Hadrian, but the design does belong to the time of Trajan. The arch um, basically gives you, again, a propaganda-approved uh, account of his reign. Uh, what we actually find on this is a whole series of allegorical uh, panels to express the aspect of Trajan, Optimus Princeps, really. Um, all the reliefs show Trajan, with groups of people in one way or the other. And what we actually find is that on one side of the arch, all the reliefs relate to Trajan and Italy. On the other side of the arch, they all relate to um, Trajan and the provinces. Well, the relief scenes are really absolutely fantastic. You've got these amazing panels of equal size, uh, six panels on each side like that, so 12 panels there, and the two big panels in the centre. Uh, a victory arch? Well, yes, no. Um, it doesn't specifically mention uh, Dacia, so it's just a general honorary arch. That's a rather terrible view looking at the other side, but just to make the point, it is exactly the same. Well, 
the reliefs inside it refer to different aspects of uh, change and drain. And one of them we can specifically identify uh, with a welfare scheme that was brought into play by Trajan, the Alimentia scheme. The Alimentia scheme was uh, a scheme whereby Trajan arranged it that poor people could take out very long-term loans so that they could buy their own land. Uh, the money for the loans was provided by local people, uh, the local rich men. Uh, poor people would then be given plots of land in order, and this is what the records say, in order that the families would be encouraged to produce children, boys to become soldiers for the Roman army, and girls to become the wives of boys to produce more children. Uh, we know from records of the Roman army that by Trajan's time fewer and fewer Italian-born men were serving in the legions. Most of them came from Spain or from France or from Asia Minor. Uh, Trajan was clearly worried about a decline in birth rates so he introduces this particular welfare scheme. This Alimentia scheme We've got inscriptions that record it, we've got coins that mention it, and we've even got literary texts that talk about it. And we can see that this is what this probably represents. What have we got here? Well, we've got these three ladies standing in the background. They've all got these little uh, crown-type uh, headdresses on. Uh, these represent Tyche, Fortune. These are spirits of individual cities or places. We can't identify which ones they are. Uh, coming over here, we've got various attendants around uh, the emperor, the emperor who, unfortunately, his head is missing, and the head of that, well, that's the emperor there, yeah, the head of that person is missing. But we can see lictors, the guys that go with the emperor. Now, look at the quality of the carving and think, again, of the Arch of Titus. It fits in with that sort of um, Arch of Titus style, you know, figures in the background in much lower relief. Um, showing to a certain extent going up in stages, so dunk, 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 like that. Uh, none of the guys have beards, and beards are very much a characteristic of the Hadrianic period, not exclusively so. I mean, if Hadrian was wearing a beard from when he was young, then Hadrian was wearing a beard in the Trajanic period, so it's not exclusively yet Hadrianic in, in date. We have uh, here, we've got a man with a child over his shoulders. We've got a table in the foreground with these conical objects on which we can recognize as money bags. And he's got a little child there, he's got his cloak held out like that because he's about to be given a money bag by the emperor while his, um, this spirit type woman uh, looks on there. So you can see what's happening here. The money bags being given to the little child uh, Daddy's saying thank you. He's got his hand out. Oh, I want some more. He reminds me, of, you know, of my children. Money, money, give me money, give me money all the time. And here you've got, you know, a father who's already received his uh, money. He's making his way back to his home. Look, see, same thing. I've got the money. <coughs> Come on, Dad. Let's go. Off we go home. The other scenes, I'm just briefly going to uh, talk about these because I want to say something about the exam before we finish. Okay, if you want to know the truth, I didn't have enough time to get a full hour's class ready, so I'll tell you something about the exam. But you've got various scenes that represent the, the provinces. Um, now, I think in the textbook this was described, did I make a note about this? Uh, yeah, in the textbook, perhaps not in the latest edition, but the previous edition, this is described as the spirit of Mesopotamia. Uh, it's not the spirit of Mesopotamia. Um, the idea being that these two river god type figures that you can see on either side uh, photograph of the actual thing, a black and white from a German publication. Uh, it, people generally often think that this must be the Tigris and the Euphrates. But what you've got here is a bridge. We know that Trajan built a massive bridge at Drobeta to get into um, Dacia. So this represents Dacia, the province of Dacia. Uh, here we've got a very clearly recognisable Trajan, again with Lictor standing by the side of him. And you've got these guys walking over the bridge. After Trajan captured Dacia, he basically brought in a process of ethnic... 
Yes, indeed, I would have laughed as well. I was about to say ethnic cleansing, yes, right. He brought in a process of ethnic cleansing. Um, prisoners of war taken to Rome for gladiators and slave labour. Uh, and he encouraged the repopulation of Dacia from citizens in other parts of the Roman Empire. What we find in Dacia are capitals in Roman buildings of the same type that we find in Asia Minor. We find the gods worshipped in Asia Minor are worshipped in Dacia. Uh, whole chunks of people left Asia Minor to settle in Dacia. So this represents the colonists going over the bridge into Dacia. Well, I'm going to uh, stop there. How's my time aspect going? Let's have a look. <coughs> this really early? Oh my gosh, this is really early. I'll be in...